when you kind of looked at yourself and kind of like thought about other people, what kind of things were you picking up on from an early age? Um, I feel like I didn't to an extent, like I, like I don't, I can't recall a specific thing, like a specific way I thought about them because I'm largely indifferent to like other people. I'm, I'm incredibly short. So I, in so far as I, I would look at other people and just kind of assume that they were judging me. So I just kind of didn't, didn't want to deal with it. I was diagnosed with growth hormone deficiency, like quite young and had to get shots every night of growth hormone and all that stuff. And it, it didn't really uh, do me that much good. I mean, I guess I could be shorter than I am, but like five foot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So then kind of, um, the way you felt about yourself compared to others was not in terms of self-esteem and stuff, this kind of affected you. Yeah, it, it, it definitely did at least like I would find other ways to make my, like build up my self-esteem. Like I'm fairly intelligent and I think a lot of that came about because I couldn't rely on like my physicality to, as like a, uh, an asset. So just train my brain a little bit and it was just something that I ran with I guess like I have never been very good at thinking future forward mm -hmm. like it's actually a horribly good failing of mine it's I I guess I've always assumed like just the world will end event like very soon so I don't have to worry about the future mm -hmm. which doesn't make any sense but did you perceive yourself as being particularly intelligent when you were from a young age? Um, I would say so. I can't remember. Like, I would always take tests and finish before it, everyone. Yeah, that was a great point of pride with me, I guess, when I look back on it, which is, like, a strange thing. But I tested well. Like, I knew I was smart. I knew that it I, I don't know. I just... I felt like that was one thing I had going for me. And then you've received various different diagnoses through the course of your life. Could you tell me a little bit more about the story of um, obtaining different diagnoses? So when I found myself in prison, I was diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder. It does. It means something to me, but, but being as it's a prison diagnosis, it wasn't really that. Um, revelatory, I guess. When I got out and finally went and got to a, a real doctor, they uh, confirmed that diagnosis and it kind of started me thinking about it a little bit more and like giving it some weight. But I've certainly met people who have been given that diagnosis, particularly if they've like commit crimes, but then it turns out that actually the diagnosis was not so accurate. So it sounds like in your situation, you were kind of not really um, taking that diagnosis as being accurate. Um, but then then some things happened later on that you kind of started to think maybe, maybe there's some truth in it. I like recently, I've definitely been leaning towards um, being on the autism spectrum. It, a lot of that rings really true with me and explains a lot of things about me that I didn't know, like, were different, I guess, is, it, is the way to put it. Like, I would always have, like, these intense physiological reactions to different things and didn't, didn't know why. I would stim a lot. There were just many behaviors that, looking back on them, like, oh, yeah, probably <laughs> been helpful. Yeah, sure. So let's let's deal with one diagnosis at a time. So let's talk about the antisocial personality disorder diagnosis first, and then we'll talk about the autism spectrum disorder one. So um, the antisocial personality disorder diagnosis, what, what were the kind of things that were consistent with that? So when you looked at the diagnostic criteria, what, what parts could you relate to? Um, the lack of regard for other people. Uh, that was That's a big one. It was just I never felt, I was never malicious, but I would not shy away from doing things that would hurt people. It, 
my my drug addiction really kind of heightened my SPD, but I don't think it was the sole factor. There was it just freed me up to do worse things than I maybe otherwise would. I stole constantly. Like I couldn't enter a store with stealing something. It's just I don't know. It was a compulsion more or less tell me a little bit about how the drug addiction started in the first place um so the way i got into drugs was there was a girl that i liked at a party and i had heard that she had done heroin before so i was like oh well i'll get some of that and then we can do a heroin together and start a beautiful relationship i guess which it is how it happened and what it turned out, but it never it didn't end well, of course. But yeah, that that was the first time I ever did it at that party, and then it just kind of slowly built from there. Like we would, it wasn't even like I don't think I was aware of trying to like fill that void or like numb any pain at the time. Like it just kind of felt good and was a means to an end but once the physical dependence really kind of kicked in it was it was a different animal so you kind of mentioned that you sort of have difficulty planning for the future or perhaps seeing consequences was that very much the case when you decided to try heroin at that party yeah uh the consequences never even came into my mind. Had you heard about heroin and had you heard about the consequences? So like, did you know on a logical level that actually heroin has like disastrous consequences for people? I I was like tangentially aware. I wasn't that exposed to it at that point, but like I, I knew that it was not a good idea. Like it, it logically was not a good idea, but, but I really disregard for self and others. <laughs> Do you tend to feel anxiety and fear about many things in your life? Um, but, uh, yeah, yes and no. Like, when I do feel it, it's incredibly intense and, like, overwhelming. But it's not about, like, little things and everyday things. It doesn't really, I don't really feel fear about any, anything like that, which isn't necessarily... A good thing because it fear motivates you to do things that need to be done and uh i just won't do them so could you give me an example of what kind of things would lead to anxiety or fear for you uh usually for me the like public speaking like speaking in front of a, a group of people was always a source of intense anxiety there's all any time i had to do a one-on-one -on -one with like someone I viewed as like a superior to me, like a police officer, what have you, an authority figure that would really, really uh, get me going. Do you care what other people think about you? Um, I care a little bit about what they think about me, but not, as I get older, it's not at all. When I was younger, there was a little bit of that, but I was, kind of confident in my everything else I had going for me, I guess, that I knew I was good enough. And like, I consistently had a girlfriend. The, the markers that I used to measure success in high school, I was meeting, so I didn't really. I want to look at some of the kind of um characteristics of antisocial personality to sort of, as you know, you know the criteria very well, but I'll just touch on like some of the manipulation um, side of things. Um, at points in your life, have you found that you're highly manipulative? There, it, it kind of snuck up on me, like other people would like be like, it, I guess it probably started in my relationships, like my my high school relationships, and it wasn't a conscious thing at first. Like I think I just I always knew what to the right thing to say to somebody to get them to do what whatever it was I wanted them to do, 
And it wasn't until later that I consciously kind of harnessed to that. Um, Did you find that in relationships it was easier to manipulate people than people who were not romantically or intimately involved with you? Uh, yeah, I think when my, the targets of my manipulation tend to be people closer to me, like just because one of my tactics is like a, a ton of attention, if that worked quite well in like relationships, girlfriend relationships, and I would kind of love bomb, quote unquote. And could you tell me a story would, about love bombing and how, what impact that had, how it was sort of effective in you achieving your goal and what happened? Um, let's see. Let's see. Uh, it just, it led to a bunch of relationships that I didn't really care about at all. And I more or less was just talking to talk and to kind of flex that muscle, I guess. And it had, it ended up in a couple relationships that went nowhere and just were toxic all the way around. It, but I never, I, oh, I continued to do it and I didn't, I didn't stop that kind of behavior until like a couple years back. Like I would, so social media was a problem for me. Like I would message people and then fall into that pattern of behavior and it was no good. Did you find that yeah. certain people responded better and more positively to love bombing than others? Um, I, so I think I wouldn't try it unless I like knew that person was receptive to it. Like, so I knew that I would feel out a person first, I guess, and then go from there. How would you tell when someone would be receptive to love bombing? What would be the early indicators? Uh, that's a good question. I don't necessarily know. I, it would probably it would probably come after like a few conversations and just I don't know, various hints, just conversation. So they're kind of responding a lot to you, perhaps, that you're giving them a little bit of attention and they're latching on to that and you're seeing that they're very responsive, that they kind of value your attention or need your attention or, or it means a lot to them. So you're kind of picking up on the way they're responding? Exactly, yeah, that far better than I could say it. <laughs> and then you know, okay, that's my target. That's perhaps, a, I don't really want to say the word victim because... Um, that might not be the right word to use, but um, but that's my that's that's someone I can target. Yeah, I mean, victim is it, they, in essence, yes, they were a victim of mine. But like, I really didn't. I was giving them a lot, and in my own mind, like that justified what I was doing. Like, oh, they're getting something out of this. Right, I'm giving them a lot of attention. Therefore, I'm not doing anything wrong. And then where would their feelings get really hurt? Um, whenever I, either I would move on to the next thing because I would get bored very easily um, or I would just once like I, I, I have a lot of superficial charm, I guess. And so once there was once I kind of exhausted all the surface level stuff and it came time to like form a deeper bond or wasn't much there for me. So they just kind of drift away. So tell me more about that. I'm, I'm really intrigued by, so you've said yourself, I've got a lot of superficial charm. So they would want more. Did you feel that there was no more you could offer and you didn't feel confident enough to form more of a relationship or you just felt that I'm not interested in connecting with someone on a deeper level? I think it was more like not, like I wanted connections, but they weren't, once I got them, it was like a goal that was achieved. You'd get bored in these situations and therefore the, the game was over, for you. the excitement was gone. Yeah, it was there, it was all just kind of an exercise for me, I guess. 
it seems looking back on it, it's always just weird to me when I take the time to look back on my past behavior. It like I can see where I went wrong a lot of times, I guess. Like it, I didn't need relationships like that, but I felt like I did. I felt like that would be part of what defined me a little bit. There, like, I was that person's uh, boyfriend. You know what I mean? I would, I, I would use that as an identity. And there was, I always, what sticks out in my head is like, I always felt like I was good at a lot of things, but I wasn't great at any one thing. And that really bothered me for a long time. So it, that kind of dug into my self-confidence a little bit. What was the worst emotional reaction that you would get from someone when you would love bomb them and then drop them quite suddenly? Mostly just a lot of tears and whatnot. It, I, so another issue I have is that I don't remember a lot from like my teen years, like almost nothing encode those memories and it's frustrating sometimes have you do you have any idea why that might be that you you don't retain memories very well from earlier years from from what i understand and what i what i gather it's that a lot of the times memory is tied to emotions and i wouldn't really have that emotional range to you know feel something intensely and then, so I would remember it. It was just kind of all relatively baseline. Nothing was that much better than anything else. So it all just kind of blurred, I guess. And was that kind of the most manipulative you got? Was just you were very manipulative in relationships, or would you be manipulative with other people as well and try to try to control or get things out of other people through the art of manipulation? Um, I think it was more about like maximizing what I could get from it every relationship I had it, I wasn't like a con person or or anything like that I didn't really I didn't try to do that I didn't try to manipulate people in that way I got enough out of the interaction with wh whoever my my target was at that point in time that, that was I guess it would be the extent of it i'm trying to think if there was anything else that sticks out and um, i was constantly just cheating and being so there was that was more than enough and then what led to you going to prison um i was selling to support my habit more or less and you can only do that so long before you get arrested. And then how long did, were you in prison for? Uh, I ended up doing two and a half years. I was sentenced to a one and a half to four and ended up doing more than my minimum because I got in the fight. And then what happened with addiction while you were in prison? So you went into prison, you were addicted to heroin, and then what happened once you were inside? Prison was actually really good thing for me it it's where I like started CBT it's where I kind of realized that there was stuff about me I needed to change because I did not like being there but uh it was I didn't like I didn't use when I was in jail I got clean I worked out every day like I gained a lot of weight I looked I felt great it was overall a really positive experience for me in like physically but mentally it was a little rough and then you so you did therapy in prison so as um as a drug offender in pennsylvania when you go to state prison you're mandated to take a, well, a tc a therapeutic community so you live in a on a certain block for four months or what have you could be longer and you go to groups every day go to classes and stuff like that it's like a very recovery focused um it, like cell, i'm not cell it's a like a unit there's a 
it's like a full ball. And how was the treatment? Was it um, was it something that you engaged well in? Were you very resistant towards it initially? Um, I, I feel like I was pretty uh, pretty amenable to it. Like I wanted I wanted to change. Like I did not want I didn't like being an addict. Like it was rough. I was sick more than I was ever like felt good. So it was a valuable thing. And I so I always saw it that way. I never really kind of push back against it it there was um it's all like learning about shame for the first time learning about like all these different things that like i feel i should have known by then but i just didn't but did you have any emotional insight when you went into prison uh, i don't i don't think i did i don't think i really uh had much of anything in the way of emotional insight. I didn't know that I didn't have that until I, I was reading about things like that. What was it that made you determined that you wanted to get clean and stay clean? Um, so the, there's a distinct memory I have of getting, I had a picture of my mom the whole time I was locked up from, it was a couple of years back and she had sent me a recent photo of herself and there was such a big difference between those two people that I was like, oh man, I'm wasting years of my life here that I will never get back. And that really was what sparked it in me, I guess. Then did you have a number of different therapists or was there one like particular therapist that you built a relationship with? Like there was one person that kind of built a relationship. Like I don't necessarily remember them very well, but um, so then, uh, so so was it the was it the kind of imposed detox that you ended up having to do in prison that helped, or was it the kind of intervention side that helped the most? Like, what actually led to you properly getting clean? Um, I would say that it was being being mandated to the TC was was a good call. So that means that you cannot leave prison until you finish the therapeutic community. Like you have to attend everything, you have to pass it essentially. And I think that was what helped equip me a little bit better to go like get out and live a halfway normal life. Um, so then you got out of prison. Um, did you stay clean after you got out of prison? I did. I managed to put together a, a nice little life for myself. Um, yeah. So then after prison, you kind of, you'd been assigned this diagnosis in prison that you didn't quite buy or you didn't give too much weight to. But after, pr after prison, you started to think, well, maybe that is, um, that is an accurate diagnosis. What kind of things led you to believe that maybe that diagnosis had some weight after all? Um, there. So when I was in jail, I had started with like meditation and yoga and stuff like that. And that kind of, and mindfulness, which is really what you want. It was just paying attention to how I was thinking and what I was thinking and reflecting on my past behaviors. I really, I knew that ASPD could explain some of those things that like felt involuntary at the time. So that was kind of what started me on it, like accepting it and believing it. But I don't know, it just, it fit so, like, I fit in it so well that there was no denying it once I, once I saw it. Right. So antisocial personality disorder, people who have that tend to really like prey on people and manipulate them. And they've got a craft for really kind of pulling strings and like, um, I feel that they can really, probably because their emotions are so shut off or they're, they, and they don't care really what people think about them, that they, they can really gain a lot of power in situations, particularly if people have a high IQ as well. If someone's really smart and they've got antisocial personality disorder, they can do a lot of damage because of, they don't care about the things that other people care about. Um, so I'm just wondering, and also it's notoriously difficult to try to, to change. Um, so I'm just wondering about your journey of kind of going, okay, I probably, 
either have this disorder or I have many traits of this disorder. And then actually trying to change some of that. So I think that my being short and like physically unimposing kind of tempered down that like violence and praying instinct, I guess. And I, I still managed to do plenty of damage in, in interpersonal relationships and whatnot. It wasn't, there was no lack of that, but it was, uh, it was, that, that's our theory is that my height was what kind of held me into the version of ASPD that I think I, I feel like I identify with. And, and of course there's a spectrum, you know, when people have antisocial personality disorder, there's people who can do you know, un, unspeakable amounts of damage. And then there's people who are just lower on the spectrum, like many disorders. Um, so I'm just wondering when you kind of came to the realization that, yeah, maybe I do meet lots of that criteria. Did you feel like you wanted to change? And then what was the change process like for you to try to try to, I guess, give up some of the traits that were not so positive? Uh, so once I realized it wasn't, it wasn't from any like kind of like moral thing that I wanted to change. It was that my, these behaviors no longer work for the situation that I was in, the life that I was living. And I needed to learn new things and learn, learn new ways to kind of live life. And like, I'm, I'm not that good at it yet. <laughs> I was still working on it, but it, there, uh, I don't know. It's weird. It's the there was no guilt motivating me. There was not really shame. Like I could think about my past like wrongdoings and and know that I should feel bad for it, but I just couldn't. Do you feel any remorse for any situations? Um, I get not really intellectually, not really. It it's like I know that my actions had consequences and I I feel sorry for them for that it's but like I don't think it's a, an, a true emotion yeah and then um guilt is not really an emotion that you can resonate with no not really that that's it that's why I had such well part of why I had such an issue with cheating that I didn't right like I just didn't care I didn't feel guilty about it I could compartmentalize and, and shut off whatever I needed to shut off. You mentioned a lot about like relationships and things that you would do to hurt people in relationships but I'm just think, trying to think of like like the other areas of your life so if you don't feel guilt and you don't feel remorse then if you just steal from someone like if they're not your partner you're just a random person you're not going to feel very bad so therefore and also people with antisocial personality sort of very impulsive so what was it those kind of behaviors obviously i know that perhaps with addiction there was a lot of those behaviors to feed your habit but if we kind of think out outside of the addiction would you be would you impulsively kind of steal from someone and do those kind of behaviors out of not feeling remorse not feeling guilt and not being able to look at consequences um there yeah stealing was a, a a big hobby of mine i i spent a lot of and 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 i didn't steal from well i <laughs> so a majority of my thievery came from like big box retailers like companies not people um so i felt that that was even more another way to like absolve myself of any guilt but I, like I, I stole a snowboard from a place one time like I just had no fear of getting caught and no just I couldn't conceive of a world where oh this is gonna I'm gonna be in jail if I do this um did that ever get addictive like the the thrill of having something that you wanted to steal or scam or defraud someone and that it was very hard to rein yourself in and and not do that behavior uh, i don't uh it feels more like it was just i didn't get that much joy out of it like i, I don't 
like I don't think that I, there was like a rush or like a, a, a thrill of getting away with it or anything. Like I think it was I wanted that thing and now I have that thing. And it was I don't know, it's just that uh, an emotional range is just not there. Yeah. So then how did things get better for you? Because you're in a relationship. How did you form that bond and manage to maintain that relationship when actually relationships had been so problematic for you? Uh, a, a ton of work on both my part and her part. Like, uh, Megan's a psychology major, so she understands, uh, you know, everything about my, about ASPD and all that good stuff. And she's been fairly instrumental in like helping me identify emotions and like know what I should be feeling and and kind of reconciling the two there it's been and it was rocky like when we first got back together it was really rocky I went and I cheated on her I did just I was a very bad boyfriend and uh thankfully she forgave me and we, we started over and I knew that if I did if I did the same thing over again she was gone there was no questions asked I was going to be just out of something that I did care about like but obviously not I didn't care enough about her not to eat on her but so it was like this strange world where like I wanted to like build that relationship but I kept finding myself doing these things that would jeopardize that relationship do you love her I do love her do you feel that your version of love might be different from how other people experience or feel it yes I'm I'm fairly certain that it's would be different if other people would be it. but not that it's necessarily like inferior to like like that emotional love like it's almost because it's a choice it's more powerful I guess because it's not just like this thing that happens it's a thing that you have to put effort into and like work on I don't know I like it more how would you describe the way that you feel love compared to what you might have heard other people describe? Um, uh, it's, it's hard to know what other people's emotions feel like, but it's, I feel like there is maybe less like altruism to it. Like it's, I don't know. Just, I, I, I'm bad with the words for my emotions. <laughs> um, so is it like the relationship benefits you and therefore you choose to be in the relationship, so therefore you're choosing to love that person rather than it being perhaps just a feeling? I think it started that way and it um, eventually morphed into something a little bit more genuine. Like, the, the once we once the cheating stopped and all that stopped it was then on to figuring out what love was for me and it i don't know what about the an ongoing journey the fear of loss so if you lost that relationship how would you i know i know you've, you've just said the emotions are not your thing but how would you what would your experience be if you lost that relationship um, so if I lost this relationship, I would be, I know I would be sad. Like, I know I would be deeply unhappy. I, now, if that's just about not, I get like a rejection of me. I don't, I don't know. It's, um, I don't know, I don't know what normal people feel when they, uh, when they lose their relationships. Is there a kind of a self-centered um, surrounding to the loss? Yes. I, yeah, it would definitely be 
be, yeah. So. And you mentioned that Megan really helped give you insight and with her understanding and um, her background in psychology that she helped you see some things. Was it difficult initially for you to respect her and listen to what she was trying to say and what she was trying to communicate with you? Um, not really. Like, I've, I've always taken, like, as, as valuable. Like, I like, le learning is one of my favorite things. So for her, like, she was able to teach me and I've always, and like I said, I love learning, so it's, it was easy for me to kind of listen to her. So respect is not an issue for you, that you can actually, you can respect someone? Uh, I mean, I, if you can respect someone and then do terrible things to them, do, like, that's not respect. So it's, like, strange. It's a weird, like, it's almost like I can exist on two different emotional levels I guess I don't know so you say that you used to do terrible things does that do you slip up and do you find yourself doing doing things that end up causing a lot of problems in the relationship and and you still kind of struggle to um to do the right thing uh so this is the longest I've ever gone like being faithful to a partner and it is easy now like it was I guess I don't, I'm not really tempted to slip. I'm not, I'm, I don't find myself doing any of those things that I used to do. It's great. The, 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 hand, the, like, the holdovers from that terrible me is like the not looking forward, like not um, doing the simple things around the house, like not cleaning up, not doing dishes, being incredibly disorganized. Like all that stuff is kind of the things that are still going on. You know what I mean? Um, and then you mentioned the future before and that difficulty planning for the future. Could you tell me a little bit about that? So when you look at your future and things you'd like to do, do you can, can you set goals and work towards them, or is that something that you really struggle with? Uh, it, that is something that I have traditionally struggled with. Um, uh, goals are just there. I would I like to set them when I'm prompted to set them, but left to my own devices, I I just don't. I'm very much an in the moment person. Go with like go with flow. Thank you. Um, now you also received another diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder at some point in your life. Could you tell me about receiving that diagnosis and then what you think of that? That is something that I kind of like what my my younger sister has autism as well and hers is much more severe than mine and so I didn't think that because the the idea of autistic didn't match what I like the, the archetype of it so I didn't really think about it until like a, a year or so ago when I don't even remember why I started like reading about it or, or you know, kind of starting to identify with it. But when I start, once I started to, I was like, oh man, that, that explains a lot of things too. It was, it's, we like, I don't know. There's a lot of, awkwardness to me that I just like I'm not I'm not self-conscious of it like if that makes any sense there's oh I don't know. as in people perceive you as awkward or you feel awkward within yourself um a little bit of column A a little bit of column B like there is like I I am now aware that my behaviors are different than from other people's a lot of the times like uh, eye contact is very difficult for me like the, they're just interacting with people is not necessarily my strong point <laughs> do you have any sensory issues that's um that's something that's quite common with asd is that something that um that you're affected by um i'm yeah i'm incredibly sensory oriented like 
um, smells are big for me. I was, a, I stim a lot. I still do. Um, but when I was younger, I would just kind of go like this when I got excited. <laughs> it was, it was like a joke. Uh, there was, uh, they would just know, everybody knew when I was excited because I would show it physically. Those, Stimming. Like, yeah. Uh, they are, those are physical manifestations of like what, I guess, what you feel inside. And a lot of times they come out as like verbal tics or physical things. Yeah. So I would just wring my hands or just like wash them together in front of me when I got excited and did various things like that. And it was like, those, those are, that's part of those things that I see, saw as involuntary. Like I had no control over them. So it was very, it was strange to me to be, to always feel so out of control of my life. Were you able to correct those um, tics that you had? Were you able to hold them in once you became aware of them? Yes and no. Like some of, some of them are still there, but it's like the, the majorly overt ones. I, like I've managed to kind of train off of myself, I guess. Like the, like I'll still find myself like, doing things with my hands that like without being aware of it but most of the time I can kind of keep control of them. Did reading about autism spectrum disorder help you look at areas of your life where you could overcome some of the difficulties caused by it? Yeah I think that like without without understanding why I felt so strange compared to other people, like based on what I had learned from a, of other people's experience, I saw mine as different. So that the realization that, you know, about that kind of helped me not, not be so hung up on like the whole feeling like, awkwardness interpersonal relationships and stuff like I there was a re there all of a sudden there was a reason you know what I mean so with this kind of diagnosis or this realization that you might have some of the traits of autism spectrum disorder was a bit of a relief because you kind of were like okay now it's all it makes sense I understand why I would be this way yeah a relief is definitely the, a good word for it and then was that did that kind of allow you to work on some of the social skills side of it? Um, not particularly. Like, I, I know that I need to, like, so I'll try to communicate that I need specific, um, like, like it works. If I'm not given, like, a, a definitive thing, if they're just hint at something, they, they want something done and they just hint at it, I, I'll completely miss it. Um, so I've been able to uh, tell them, I need you to tell me exactly what you need done and when you need it done by so that I can know that, know that thing. Um, it's, it's a, there's a lot of little things like that that I try to do, but it's not always because you've got a dual diagnosis um you've got the um antisocial personality disorder that you were you were assigned that diagnosis and then you came to the realization that actually you meet a lot of the criteria of asd so there's like the, with this dual diagnosis was that was that a lot for you to be like oh i've got this and i've got this and how do i how do i you know change how do i how do i try to um create change in my life or achieve change in my life when i've got I've got all these diagnoses. Um. For me, it's been, it's, it's less about the diagnosis and more about what I like get from the knowledge of it. Like, I don't know, that doesn't make any sense, but it's, it wasn't ever really a burden. Like ASPD was something that like, I don't know, just knowing that there was an explanation for why I behaved the way I did was 
enough of like a comfort, I guess, to move forward. Uh, that makes no sense. <laughs> Um, so it's, um, I mean, well, the way I see diagnosis is it's only ever helpful to give someone a diagnosis in order to help them, either give them the right treatment or give them the right support or give them the right information that would um, improve their quality of life. Yeah, I, I think that, like, it, the things are meaningless without being applied. So it's, they can be helpful for steps to realizing like where your shortcomings may be. Uh, that's how it functioned for me. Like it helped me identify the, the areas where I was here and, and kind of build from there. Do you have the capacity for empathy, do you think? Uh, I think empathy is something that I've learned to like feel. It does not come naturally to me, but I have spent a lot of time like kind of reflecting on empathy and on like other people's journeys and whatnot. And it's become like a cognitive empathy that I can feel. Yeah. People who've got really, if people who've got like high empathy or good empathy do very well in therapeutic relationships. So they do very well in, in therapy. And I'm just wondering, is it the case that you would do really well in like a practical type of therapy where you're given like information and you're given like very specific behavioral steps that you should take to improve your life, particularly to improve your life and that um, it would help with maintaining relationships and, and all of these kind of goals that you would like or things that you'd like for yourself rather than actually a therapy where you just end up like talking a lot with the therapist yeah the the, the practical approach is definitely more my style I'm very very much a hands-on person like I'm very much uh, like a tinkerer so to have like a detailed kind of layout of what needs to be done or, or areas that need addressed that it helps a lot if someone is watching this video and they've been assigned the diagnosis antisocial personality disorder or they believe they have this diagnosis um, you've clearly taken steps in your life to um, to change how would you what advice would you give someone who's struggling with with that diagnosis and, and they would like a better life for themselves it was not ever really easy to change and it's still not like the easiest thing but it, it it's a, it, of course worth it like but if they so if you're struggling with it it's maybe realize that it's not a, the label is not that bad I don't know what there's sometimes there's a lot of resistance just in in being labeled with something and I really do believe that it's not the label, but it's what that allows you to like kind of unlock within yourself. So it can be a pathway to a better life. Yeah. So if people with that diagnosis can understand themselves better and then that will help them with actually focusing on what areas they might want to change, particularly in terms of specific behaviors that they want to try and drop or break out of. Yeah, for, for, like, for me, the consequences had to be so bad that I was moved to, to change. Like, I don't necessarily know, even really know why I was able to kind of like break through there. There was just like a can't even remember it like now, but it, there was that very much like a switch that was flipped, and I all of a sudden, like all of a sudden, it was, but it was very much like a big shift in my thinking, and I wish I knew what it did, <laughs> but I was a criminal <laughs> for all intents and purposes. Like I, I. Drove recklessly, like I just, I really had no regard for other people and for myself. So, I, yeah, and 
it now I I don't know what it is, but like I don't I don't speed anymore. I don't. It's like this weird shift to I don't know respond like reasonable behaviors me better. I guess now. It's, it's hard to... Do you have a lot more regard for yourself now? Because you didn't care about others and you didn't care about yourself. But now do you feel that you care more about yourself? Um, I think that's probably an area in which I'm a little bit weaker like than, than other that I've worked on. Uh, I do have more regard for myself, but it's not like... It's probably not what a normal person feels, I guess. Like, I, I would put myself in situations pretty quick, even now, I think. Yeah. Do you still have that impulsive streak to you? Yeah, impulsivity is a, a big problem. <laughs> how do you rein that in? Or how do you how do you try to control that more these days? Um, self-talk, like regulating my self-talk. Like this, I've been at my job for over two years now this is the longest i ever managed to hold down a job mm -hmm. well and, done but there were still there were still times where i just want to say f this and and leave and old me would have done that uh this me knows that i have a partner that depends on me and a son that depends on me and that there are that it's not worth it i guess so yeah, yeah i just had to be aware of the consequences. Yeah. I had to actually consciously think about them. Like, I had to make sure I thought about them. Yeah. Well done. You sound like someone where change was incredibly difficult and that actually you were very resistant to change because if, if you're like forced into therapy and they want to talk about feelings, you're, you're not going to enjoy that process. So change for you uh, really had to come from within. I think you really hit a rock bottom and I think it must take a lot of um, willpower on your part that you really have to like keep pushing yourself to to stay on the right track yeah it, it has not been easy I feel like I don't feel like I've been resistant to but it you know, you know yes I am I don't like talking about my feelings I find it very difficult like, so there's there's times where I physically cannot verbalize things like it's um, Greg, I found you on your girlfriend's channel. Um, for the audience, could you tell, just tell me what that channel is so that they can check it out? Uh, yeah, her channel is Megan F.